for his role as CEO of Shapeshift, one of the most established and successful high-profile companies in the crypto industry. Um, Eric was one of the first people in the world to go full crypto. Um, and he was behind one of the original trading desks in New York City, as well as some of the early efforts in gaming. Um, now, uh, even the focus of Nathaniel Popper's uh, 2016 digital gold book really put the spotlight on how Eric had already made the sort of psychological leap uh, to go full crypto. So before Eric was known for Shapeshift or any of that stuff, it was really his blog, Money and State, and the great things he had to say uh, in some of his conference appearances uh, that made him a household name in crypto. So welcome, Eric. Hey, happy having day. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, we have quite a religious calendar that we've built in 10 years here, you know, between, I like to think of the uh, October 31st day as kind of conception, and then the birthday on, on January 3rd, or even 9th, perhaps, a bit of incubation there. Uh, and now pizza day next week, let's not forget, we've got pizza day. And for everyone out there, uh, Eric um, and Shapeshift and Coindesk have come together on a bit of a wallet uh, project here, uh, looking to do that going forward. And we do have some pizzas available on it. So go ahead and have a look at that wallet and you can get some NFTs that'll give you pizzas. Um, now, um, we had Saif Adian on a little while ago talking about central banking as one of these institutions. Now, central banking is definitely one of your um, you know, things you think about. It's, it's part of what your, your, your worldview and, and, and one of those institutions that need to change. But I would take your um, viewpoint as a little larger than what Saif Adian is looking at. You look at central governments in general, not just central banking, a bit of a, a larger view. Now, we've seen some of the most amazing um, um, reactions that governments uh, have had around the world, all different cases. And, and what are your reactions to this, this use of power that we've seen in the past few weeks from governments around the world? Mm, that's quite a question. So first, I, I'm not surprised by any of it. Uh, whenever people have problems these days, they tend to ask, beg, uh, desire the government to step in and solve those problems for them. Some of those problems can be solved by governments, some of them cannot be, and many think they can be solved, but actually end up making things worse. So um, certainly as the coronavirus has spread around the world, it's been a, a horrible human tragedy. And that, you know, tens of thousands of people dying and just completely awful. Um, many people, I think, will know someone who's who's been uh, directly affected or or has died from this, um, and that's a serious problem. But but that will recede at some point. the The virus will will go away over time within a year, and what won't go away is the intervention, and specifically the the habit of intervention and the the ways in which the government has further encroached into people's lives. Some of some of them small, some of them big. That never recedes. That doesn't go away when the weather gets warmer or when a vaccine is found. There's no government vaccine that we can take next year. So what what I'm really worried about isn't the the short and medium term effects of the virus so much as the long term effects of uh, the further government intrusions, not just into the uh, into the economy, but into people's um, social lives and behaviors. So in, in your perfect world where, let's say, people had all adopted crypto already, um, I guess, how would this situation be different um, than what we're seeing now? Well, there's no such thing as a perfect world. So as much as crypto, I think, would make the world better, it, it doesn't make it perfect. It still has plenty of problems. But a world in which people were using real money, and by real, I mean something that that originated from a marketplace versus from a from a government. Um, it would be one in which a virus uh, could not could not change the long-term relationships of, uh, of economic actors. And so by that I mean uh, right now with fiat when banks step in, when governments step in and change monetary policy in response, the economic interactions of people uh, both right now and over the coming years will be drastically affected by that activity. Um, as as Saif Dian said earlier, it always feels good when you have the heroin shot, uh, but the effects of that are what are really, really problematic. So in a world where people were using real money, market-based money, um, the marketplace would be less influenced by uh, by governments who are quick to jump into complex systems that they 
don't understand well and cannot affect nearly as beneficially as they believe in. I mean, do you think that, well, I guess so in with Bitcoin or, you know, broader cryptocurrency, maybe, um, you know, the same could be sort of said is that we we have a system that maybe not all the actors who are able to make some sort of decisions understand how, you know, how nuanced and complicated the world is. Um, I guess what how would you respond to that? Well, with Bitcoin, it removes the ability of humans to change the monetary policy. And and ultimately, that's good in the same way that we we don't have the ability to affect mathematics when we get scared about a virus. We don't have the ability to affect uh, gravity or the the changing of the seasons or how the planets orbit the sun. We don't have an ability to change any of that stuff when we get scared of a virus. And something as as crucial as money, which is you know the most important good in the society, is how humans interact day to day with each other. Um, that kind of thing should not be uh, within the purview of any small group of people to unilaterally change. Um, I think it will be very clear in the future, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years uh, in, in the future, that a, a group of central bankers deciding what the price of money should be will appear very, very foolish indeed. And um, in Bitcoin, that power is is removed from people. And that's why ultimately it will be much more trustworthy over time and is why ultimately it will retain its value far better over time. So the economist Joshua Gans, who spoke at Consensus last year, has weighed in on the recent um, inflation risks in America. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Sh- certainly three trillion, I guess it was, was printed, maybe more. Um, not even sure where we're at right now. No one is, I guess. A uh, bunch of trillions were printed. And we're rounding money. to the trillion now, which is crazy. Rounding to the trillion now. A lot of money was printed. Um, but what he said was, look, in a, in a scenario like this, where things are already so imbalanced unnaturally, so demand was evaporated by everyone staying at home. And he said, this is the one circumstance where you can actually get away with printing money. It's free money because demand is so low, so you're not putting anything out of balance, right? So his theory was when you print money and demand stays the same, you're you're out of balance. So now maybe he's right. I mean, this stuff is really complicated. I don't think any of us can really have that vantage point, understand how complex a lot of this stuff is. But let's say he is right this time. Let's say it was free money, demand was so low and was okay. In your worldview, in your predictions, do you see this becoming a habit of governments that now that the Pandora's box is open, we can start solving any one of our problems and perhaps that imbalance will will, will find our way to that imbalance? Yeah, I mean, the, certainly the Pandora's box opened in the last crisis in 2008. That's when, when really this idea of print money and call it something like quantitative easing was, um, was, was floated, was debated a lot back then. Um, but ultimately, they went ahead with it. And the, the bad consequences of that haven't really appeared yet. So advocates of that kind of policy uh, can continue to advocate it. And so this time, when, uh, when the crisis hit, there wasn't even any debate about whether people should print money, whether the government should print money or um, whether that would help anyone. Uh, all major economists, all politicians, everyone on Wall Street, um, and certainly much or most of the business community, all agreed that we should print money immediately. It was just a question of whether it's $500 billion or, or $2 trillion and and uh, ultimately they decided, let's do both. Let's do two and a half, three or $4 trillion. Um, it's it's just preposterous. You printing money does not print wealth. It does not print wealth. It simply rearranges how wealth works in society. And what you're doing is you're essentially taking wealth from the future and you're giving it to people today. And of course, people today, when you print that money, will feel good about that. The damage is distributed over time, and the damage can be very pernicious and very severe. And to that person who said that. I think he could make that argument if there was any plausible suggestion that the money would be destroyed after the crisis recedes. Uh, If the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve actually went back uh, to something normal after this, at least he could make that argument. I would still take other issues with it, but he could make that argument. But all of us know that the the Fed's balance sheet will not return to anything normal. 
Indeed, it did not after the 2008 financial crisis. But don't forget, this is not a, they did not borrow money this time. They printed money. There is a difference, and it's an important difference. Right. Right. Borrowing is more honest. Printing is just mm-hmm. bar, pr- pr- printing <laughs> is just stealing. I mean, when you print when you print money, you are stealing purchasing power from all the people that hold money mm-hmm. today and in in the future. It is just that pretty big pre mine. It's a big pre mine. <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's a pre-mine um, which is not stated up front in the white paper. Mm-hmm. So it's it's more like a pre-mine that can happen at any time, ongoing, with no one uh, clear on when it will occur or how big it will be. It's it's but, just theft. So I want to mm-hmm. shift gears just a little bit. Um, I just want to talk about shape shift, shape shift a bit. Um, are you guys planning any big cool things at Shape Shift coming up? Yeah, people always like to ask this, and and I want to tell them what the big cool things are, but but we can't do that yet. We can't tell people what we have uh, coming down the pipeline. Um, we have our our mobile app coming out very soon, so I think people can get excited about that. Uh, and ultimately, I think uh, people heard recently that we acquired Portis. Um, so Portis is basically a a beautiful way to get self custody in an experience that is as easy as logging into. Uh, any website with an email and a password, you can have a self-custody wallet. And so we have big plans with that technology uh, in the ShapeShift platform and around the ecosystem. Have you, has your ideas about how cryptocurrency and blockchain will work with the everyday user, um, has that shifted since you've been at ShapeShift? So again, as Nolan mentioned, you know, pretty anti-state, um, one of the first people to go all crypto, Um, but we have seen the regulators sort of catch up and have to put different, um, put different rules onto you guys at Shapeshift and you've had to deal with some of that. So has, has that changed your view of how cryptocurrency will take over the world or be used by the everyday person? No, um, it hasn't. I mean, I have to say that I'm, I'm thankful that the governments of the world have not realized uh, as quickly as I feared they might, how existential of a threat Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies were to fiat. I think there is a combination of of hubris and economic illiteracy, which prevent uh, banks, the financial establishment and government from really understanding what is playing out over the next couple of decades. Uh, and that is that fiat currencies, currencies that are based on uh, politicians' wishes, will tend to go away over time and real market-based money that is very effective in a digital age uh, will, will take over. And this won't happen overnight. It will happen at the margins over time. Um, and you know, my, my daughter and, and certainly her daughter will grow up in a world in which, um, in which they, they actually get to use real market-based money. And this, this will be a great thing. It will mean prosperity for the world. It will mean honesty and integrity in our financial system. Um, And this is something I'm immensely proud to be part of. Does your daughter already have a Bitcoin savings account? (laughs) Uh, She does. She's not old enough to understand that yet, but she knows the name Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, she knows the the Bitcoin logo and she points it out. We we saw some Bitcoin graffiti the other day. Um, It was the Bitcoin logo in the street and uh, she saw it and she pointed to it and said Bitcoin and Warmed my heart. She'll be eating pizza. She'll be eating pizza one <laughs> night for dinner next week. I bet. She loves pizza. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thanks, guys. Um, we'll be hearing a lot more from Eric in the coming months. Um, as he mentioned, Portis and the wallet. Uh, you can have a look at that wallet at wallet.coindesk.com right now. Um, now, on our other feeds, Umbrella. Um, we've got a track called Foundations, uh, which I put a lot of time into. It's a pretty interesting track. Um, each platform has about an hour. Um, the first 15 minutes, they give some financial updates, some roadmap updates. We've got some analysts who will ask those folks questions. Uh, we often have founders of chains asking those, uh, are, are presenting and then analysts asking those questions. So we've got Cosmos, Ethereum. We've got some of the private shops working on Bitcoin, like Blockstream and RSK. We've got 21 foundations in all, and they'll be going from now until next Thursday, I think. I think we've got one Thursday. Um, but there'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, so have a look at that right now. Um, and go onto the wallet, have a look at Coindesk.com, um, and see all of the interesting things we have from our sponsors. 
Now, uh, we're going to take a break, uh, and then we'll be back right after this with a story on media, crypto Twitter, and we'll have Dobie Wan and Nick Carter. Thanks a ton.